بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له من يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه أما بعض فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار As it relates to the issue of death and what I'm going to discuss one of the many practical ways that the Muslim man and the Muslim woman should preoccupy themselves with in terms of preparing for death is no doubt an important topic. The man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as Al-Imam al-Bukhari and Al-Imam Muslim have collected in their books of hadith and he asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the intelligent question Ya Rasulullah mata sa'a Ya Rasulullah when is the hour going to be established? The Prophet instead of answering that question sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he asked the man a question and he said to him Mada a'tatta laha What did you prepare for the hour? Instead of preoccupying yourselves with the spectacle of death itself or Instead of you preoccupying yourself with the exact time that the hour is going to be established, what makes more sense is for you to answer the question, what have you done to prepare for when the hour comes? The man responded to that question by saying, Inni uhibbullaha wa rasulahu. He said, I prepare for death for this hour and that I love Allah and his messenger. That's what I prepared. I'm practicing Islam. I love Allah and His Messenger, and as a result of that, I believe in everything that has been legislated in the religion. And even though I may have some human frailties, and even though I may fall short of the mark, nonetheless, I love Allah and I love His Messenger. Upon hearing that, the Prophet said to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, "Anta ma'man ahbabta." Then you will be with those who you love when the hour is established. So it's from this angle, brothers and sisters, that we deal with one of the many practical ways of preparing for death. And then our beloved and respected brother, Elias, is going to deal with the issue of death itself, inshallah. No doubt, there are many things that we can mention here. We can just give you the general answer. Everyone who wants to be prepared for death, he has to practice the religion of Al-Islam. Practice the Quran and the Sunnah and you'll be successful. The Prophet told his companions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he told us in turn, مَا مِن شَيْءٍ يُقَرِّبُكُمْ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ وَمَا مِن شَيْءٍ يُقَرِّبُكُمْ مِنَ النَّارِ إِلَّا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْهُ There is nothing, there is not a single thing in this dunya that will cause you people to come closer to the Jannah except I told you to do it, I ordered you to do it. I ordered you to make salat, I ordered you to fast in Ramadan, I ordered you to wear hijab, I ordered you to be diligent in taking care of your parents and so forth and so on. And there's nothing that will cause you people to come close to the hellfire except that I prohibited you from it. So every haram in Al-Islam is prohibited because it will lead you to the hellfire. Not wearing hijab, not praying drinking, partying, hanging out, free mixing, listening to music, all of those things that are haram will lead you to the hellfire. So it's easy for us to come and say that as the general rule and then we all get up and we go. But everyone here already knows that, that if you practice Al-Islam, you will be prepared for the death because Al-Islam being the complete way of life, it prepares for the spectacle of death and it prepares the Muslim who's intelligent what he needs to do in terms of being ready for this day. But I chose to talk about another issue that's from the Ibadat of Al-Islam that many people are negligent concerning it 
but it is vital. And there's not a single person here except that he really needs to take heed of this particular issue, all of us, and raise our level of commitment and application of this particular ibadah from the ibadat of Al-Islam in preparation for death. Because this dunya that we live in, it naturally takes people away from the remembrance of Allah and it naturally takes people away from realizing the reality that you're going to die. So the practical way that I want to talk about and share with you brothers and sisters here today, not as a lecture, but as a form of advice, advice to you and advice to me. So I really want you to pay attention and try to comprehend and try to remember and then try to apply and practice. Because this is not just a lecture, this is nasiha to you that you're going to need. And I'm going to remind myself of the importance of it when I share it with you. So I hope no one looks and views what I'm about to say as just time to fill up for the space of the lecture. No, this is a practical way that we can use a weapon that Allah has given us to prepare for the death. And that practical way is a dua. A dua. The ibadah of a dua. The ibadah of a dua. One of the greatest forms of ibadah in Al Islam is a dua. The one that the Prophet said about it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man la yadu'ullah yagdab alayhi. Whoever does not make dua to Allah, Allah becomes angry with that individual. And that is because there's not a single brother sitting here or a single sister sitting here except that we are all in need of a dua. And your success is only if Allah Ta'ala makes you successful. There are those of us who have issues. We want to get married. You're not going to get married unless Allah gives you the tawfiq. There are those from amongst us. We have relatives who are gravely ill. They will not become well except if Allah wills it. There are those of us who have other issues. There's not a single person here except that he needs to make more dua because everyone is in need. So Allah has established in the Quran, Antum al ila Allah. You people are poor and you are in need as it relates to Allah. So with that being the case, why don't the people call on Allah more often? Me as an individual, you as an individual, knowing the importance of calling on Allah, why don't we call on Allah more often? So the one who doesn't make dua to Allah, Allah becomes angry with them because that's a sign of kibbutz. That's a sign of that person being arrogant and seeing himself as being self-sufficient. He doesn't have to rely on anyone else. So Allah becomes angry with that individual. Allah Ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran and describing the believers, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ عُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لُكُمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ إِبَادَتِهِ سَيَدْخُلُونَ الْجَهَنَّمَ الْدَاخِرِينَ And your Lord has said to you, Call on me and I will answer your supplication. For whatever you need, call on me and I will answer your dua. Verily, those people who are arrogant and they refuse to make dua, they will enter into the hellfire from those who are lowly. So what did the Prophet teach us? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He taught us as it relates to death. We have to pray every single day, five times a day, at least. Everyone has to pray five times a day. Praying is going to bring you closer to Jannah. A person doesn't make a sajda except that it raises his level in the akhirah. If he's not making sajda, he will not get that elevation, obviously. In this prayer that we make, Rasulullah told one of his companions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a dua to make after each and every salah. He told him to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhabi jahannam wa adhabi al-qabr wa fitna al-mahya wal-mamat wa sharri fitna al-masih dajjal Say that at the end of each of your prayers, whether it is before the taslim, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, or after the taslim. But it should be before the taslim. That's the strongest opinion. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the punishment of the hellfire. And I seek refuge in you from the punishment of the grave that's going to take place. And I seek refuge in you from the fitna of living and the fitna of death. The fitna of living 
is that I become cognizant about why I have been created and why I've been placed in this earth. I have not created mankind in the jinn except for the sole purpose of worshiping me. Getting a degree from Aston University is a vehicle in worshiping Allah. And it is not the goal and the objective as to why we've been created. Getting married is a vehicle to worship in Allah. And it is not the goal and the objective as to why Allah Azawajal has created us. So I seek refuge in you from the fitna of the mahya of this life. The life that is designed to take me away from the remembrance of Allah. To do those things that are going to cause me to come closer to the Jannah and take me to the paradise that Allah has prepared for the mu'mineen. And I seek refuge in you from the fitna of death, that I may die on other than the religion of Al-Islam, that I may die like the Pope died on other than the religion of Al-Islam. And the reason why I mention the Pope is because I've been amazed to hear that Muslims today don't even know that a person who is the representative of kufr and shirk and the representative of making polytheism, setting up partners and idols along with Allah's wajal, Muslims don't know that that individual goes to the hellfire. Muslims today will tell you, no, he's from the, he's from the Ahlul Jannah. Or oh, we don't know what the man died on. But Allah Ta'ala in the eloquence of the Quran, in so many ayats, he has told us, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ فَارِقُ الثَّلَاثَ They have disbelieved those who say that Allah is one of three from the eloquence of the Quran is that Allah Ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran in so many ayat in alladhina kathabu bi ayatina wa astakbaru anha la tufattahu lahum abwaabu as-sama wa la yadkhuluna al-janna hatta yaliju al-jamal fi sim al-khiyat those people who reject and they disbelieve in our signs. The doors of the paradise, of the skies, of the heavens will never be open for them. And they will never enter into the Jannah until the camel can pass through the eye of a needle. So if someone were to take the needle and he were to ask himself the rhetorical question, will a camel ever be able to pass through the eye of a needle? He's going to say, La Wallahi. That's Allah's way in eloquence. The Quran stating to us that if a person dies on other than the deen of Al-Islam, the fitna of the death and the fitna of this life, if he dies on other than the deen of Al-Islam, he's going to be in trouble. And that's a point that no Muslim should be in doubt about. So this hadith or this ayat that Rasulullah sallallahu used to teach the companions, this dua, Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the punishment of the Jahannam and I seek refuge in you from the punishment that's going to take place in the grave. I seek refuge in you as well from the fitna of the hayat and the fitna of al-mamat, al-mawt, from the death. And I seek refuge in you from the fitna of al-masih, al-dajjal, from the dajjal when he comes. That goes to show that Rasulullah sallallahu taught his companions one of the practical ways of preparing for death is to preoccupy yourself with making dua because no one can be successful in the thing that he wants to accomplish whatever it is no matter how big it is no matter how small it is the success is only with Allah Azza so as it relates to the dua ikhwani being a revert to al-islam being a person who has taken the teachings of al-Islam directly from the sources, the Quran and the authentic sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been understood by the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa radiyallahu anhum as has been taught by the great scholars of al-Islam past and present like al-Imam Abu Hanifa and other than him rahimahullahu ta'ala being a revert to al-Islam I've come to see as it relates to the ibadat the worship in El Islam, the Muslims are doing a lot of things. And we're doing them different ways. So what we want to do here today as it relates to the dua and the importance of the dua is we want to share with you some of the etiquettes that you need to know about in order to make the right dua. Because there are many people who make dua, but the dua is not answered. One of the reasons it's not answered is because we're not knocking on the door the proper way. 
We're not making the dua the proper way. There are certain things that should be done and that shouldn't be done as it relates to dua in order to make the dua answer. So what I want to do is I want to teach you brothers and you sisters in talking about this practical aspect of preparing for death and asking Allah and making dua to make us of those people who die in this deen. And tackling this subject, we want to draw your attention to another issue we're going to draw upon. And that is the etiquette of a dua that we see in Surah Al-Fatiha. The etiquette of a dua that we see in Surah Al-Fatiha. Some of you have memorized Jews Amma, and some of you only memorized two or three surahs of the Quran. Some of us memorize some of those ayat and surah that are well known in the Muslim world, like Surah Al Yasin, the beginning of Baqarah, the beginning of Surah Al Kath, and so forth and so on. Everyone is on a different level. But there's no one here from the Muslims except that you've memorized Surah Al Fatiha. But this surah, Ikhwani, is a surah of the Quran that many people do not reflect upon the treasures that are contained in the surah itself. The surah that the Prophet described, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he told his companion, Shall I not teach you the greatest surah of the Quran? The single greatest surah of the whole Quran, Shall I not teach you? The man said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala Alaihi Wasallam, Al Fatiha tu. He has Sabun Mutani wal Quran al Azim al Ladi Uti tuhu. He said, It is Surah al Fatiha. It is the seven oft repeated verses and the magnificent the Quran that I have been given. The greatest surah of the Quran is Surah al Fatiha. It is the seven oft repeated verses and the magnificent Quran that I have been given. Surah Al-Fatiha, also Ikhwan, brothers and sisters, is known as Umul Kitab, the mother of the book, showing its importance. It is the mother of the Quran. Surah Al-Fatiha is memorized by everyone here because if you're praying, you're going to read Surah Al-Fatiha at least 17 times every single day. You may forget some surah that you learned when you were a child. You may forget some of the ayat of a surah that you're working on right now or that you remember recently. You may forget, but no one ever messes up or forgets the ayat of Surah Al-Fatiha because we read it so many times. There were a group of companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who were on a trip and they came upon a group of Arabs in the desert and they request, requested from those Arabs to give them some hospitality since they were in the middle of the desert and they were kind of like wayfarers because those Arabs weren't Muslims and they had enmity towards the Muslims they refused to give them any hospitality so the companions under the emirship of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu they continued their trip Allah Ta'ala caused the leader of those people who refused the hospitality to the companions to be stung by a scorpion or bit by a poisonous snake the leader many times has to bear the brunt of the burden of the decisions that his people make because he is ultimately the one who's responsible. So when the people said, no, we're not going to give you hospitality, the scorpion, the snake bit the leader. He was dying from the poison. So the people said amongst themselves, why don't you go and ask those people who came from Medina, radiallahu anhum, go ask them, do they have any local medicines that we can give to the leader. So they went to the companions and they asked them, do they have anything? The companions in this situation, they had the upper hand. They could have made it personal. They could have said to the people, no, you remember what you did? You guys refused us hospitality. So we're not doing anything for you. But that wasn't the way of the companions. And that's not the way of the Muslims. The Muslims are not a group of people who are irresponsible and they just go and they want to destroy. They are destructive. Muslims are builders. Muslims are responsible. Muslims are constructive. Muslims have been placed on this earth to worship Allah and worshiping Allah, bringing good to the people. Kuntum khayra ummatan ukhrijat lil nas. You people are the best people who have been brought forth 
for the people. We don't go and cause people to hate the religion of Islam, disrupt the normal way people live, get rid of security that is a right of every human being, whether he is a Muslim or not Muslim. Abu Sa'id al Khudri said, Yes, I have something I can perform on him. But before I do this, I want you people to agree to give us something in return. Give us 30 sheep, a sheep for each man in our group. Those people agreed. Abu Sa'id al Khudri went back and he read over the man Surat al Fatiha. This is in Sahih al Bukhari, in the chapter of the virtues of the Quran, Surat al Fatiha. He read over the man seven times. Surat al-Fatiha. After the seventh time, he spit on the man. Because after the person reads Surat al-Fatiha, or any aspect of the Quran, the spittle that comes out of his mouth after that has barakah on it. So when he read Surat al-Fatiha seven times over the sick man, the man stood up and started walking around as if he was okay. So the kuffar gave them the camels. Each man said, give me my camel. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said, no. We have to go see if this was okay. We have to ask Rasulullah sallallahu When they got to Medina, they told him the story. Rasulullah said to Abu Sa'id al-Khudri sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa radiyallahu an Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, he said, wa ma yudrika annaha ruqya. How did you know, Abu Sa'id? That Surat al-Fatiha was a ruqya. How did you know that Surat al-Fatiha is a surah that if the woman is experiencing the pains that she get at the beginning of each month, she can just read Surat al-Fatiha on herself. The person who's suffering from some type of sickness or disease before spending money to go to the doctor here or there, he uses the Quran. But because of the weak iman in the Quran, we don't think about that. We think about the monetary ways of curing ourselves. And Allah is mentioned in the Quran, وَنُنَزِّرُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ We have revealed in the Quran that which is a shifa and a rahma to the believers. So those of you who are studying Ikhwan, brothers and sisters, as it relates to your tests, your exams that you're about to take, you become stressed out. Wallahi, there's a dua for stress and anxiety. From the benefits of the Quran is to read the Quran over yourself, whatever the surah is, Surah Al-Fatiha, it'll take away the anxiety and the stress. It will take away, Wallahi, some of the more serious diseases that people are dealing with. But you have to have iman. So, Surah Al-Fatiha is without doubt the greatest surah of the Quran. And in that surah, there are some etiquettes that we need to learn as it relates to making dua. The first and most important etiquette that comes from Surah Al-Fatiha that I want you guys to remember. From the etiquettes of making dua, from Surah Al-Fatiha, is that the person who's making dua, he has to make dua to Allah. And he has to make dua with ikhlas. He cannot make dua to other than Allah. Someone may sit there and say, oh, that's elementary, fundamental. We all know that. We all know that, but we don't all practice that. And that's not manifested in the Islam of the vast majority of Muslims, especially those who are from the Asian persuasion. The Asian persuasion. Since I've come to England and I've started to live and mix with the Asians, I've seen a lot of strange things. And this is not something peculiar to Asians. If you go to Africa, the same issue, African version of Islam. If you go to the Arabs, the Arab version of Islam. What we want is, we want the pure Islam from A to Z, the pure Islam. As for the people's culture, those cultural aspects that are not connected to the deen, no problem. But allowing the culture into the deen is a major problem. Making dua only to Allah with ikhlas. Where is the proof of that? The proof of that from Surah Al-Fatiha is that Allah Ta'ala told us to say in Surah Al-Fatiha and Surah Al-Fatiha is a dua itself. And the proof that it is a dua is that after you read Surah Al-Fatiha, غير المغضوب عليهم والضالين Everyone says, Ameen, because it's a dua. Allah answered that dua. As it relates to ikhlas, the proof of having ikhlas in the dua 
is the statement of Allah Ta'ala in Surah Al-Fatiha, Iyaka na'bud wa Iyaka nasta'een. You are the one that we worship and you are the one who we seek your aid and your assistance. That's Surah Al-Fatiha, the dua of the believers from Surah Al-Fatiha. Iyaka na'bud wa Iyaka nasta'een. You're the one we worship and you're the one who we seek aid from. That is the theoretic understanding of ibadah that is only for Allah. But I'm sure some of you would attest to the fact that if you go into the home of the Muslim, you will find the picture, Ya Allah, Ya Muhammad, O oh Allah, O oh Muhammad, Ya Ali al madid Ya Muhammad is not permissible. Ya Ali al madid is not permissible. Someone, he wants to get married. Someone, he wants to accomplish something. He goes to the Peter Saab and he says to the Peter Saab, do this, do that, do this. And sometimes he's advised to do something that's from the shirk and the kufr of Islam. If you tell someone, you cannot say Ya Muhammad. You have to only say Ya Allah. The person will say, you don't love Rasulullah, you a Wahhabi. You don't love Rasulullah, you a Wahhabi. Well, I want to share something with you, brothers and sisters, to show the double standards of the Muslims today. Double standards. A year, a few years ago, I lost my youngest brother. He had a disease called sickle cell anemia. That's a blood disease that afflicts African Americans and Africans only. Asians don't get it, Caucasians don't get it, African Americans, problems in the blood. When he was dying, being the youngest of four children, when he was dying, my mother was in the hospital and the doctor said to her, there's nothing we can do for him, Miss Mamie, you just have to pray, that's all. It's just a matter of time. My mother has always looked at him as being her favorite child because he's the youngest and he's been sick with the disease all of his life, suffered, struggled. So my mother, while he was on his deathbed in the hospital, she got on top of him from the side of the bed and she was hugging him and she was crying. Tears were coming out of her nose. Mucus was coming, tears were coming out of her eyes. Mucus was coming out of her nose and she was making dua with ikhlas. And she was saying, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, my baby, my baby, Jesus, don't take my baby. Oh, Jesus, please. Well, Rahi, if any one of you would have walked into that room, if your grandmother, your grandfather, your great grandmother, great grandfather who can't read or write, they're from the village of Mirpur, they can't read or write. Had they walked into the room at that moment, they would have said, yeah, Miss Mamie, Wallahi, calling on Jesus will never help your baby. Jesus can't help himself. And wallahi, that's the haq, that's the truth. Jesus can't help himself. But why is it now, after we say that to Miss Mamie, my mother, we turn around and say, Ya Muhammad, Ya Muhammad. The Prophet came out, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he said to the people who were the closest people to him, Ya Abbas, Amma Rasulillah. Oh Abbas, the uncle of Rasulullah, ask for my money, whatever you want, I'll give it to you, but I cannot help you with Allah. O oh, Safiya, the aunt of Rasulullah, ask for my money, whatever you want. I'll give it to you, but I can't help you with Allah. O oh, Fatima, the daughter of Rasulullah, ask for my money, whatever you want, but I cannot help you as it relates to Allah. Azawajal. Those are the closest people to Rasulullah, and he's telling them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I can't help you. Now you think that you're going to come and not practice the deen? You're going to come and knock on the door only when you get in trouble. And instead of going directly to Allah, you're going to go through Rasulullah. And he said to those who are close with him, I can't help you, but he's going to help you. No, it doesn't make sense. So, the companion Abu Sa'id or Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, 
who was a prolific companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked the Prophet an intelligent question that caused the Prophet's heart to become tranquil and he became pleased with the questioner. And he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, Man as'adu nas bi shafa'at yawm al-qiyamah Which one of us who have the most right to getting your intercession yawm al-qiyamah? We are making a lot of mistakes. We miss out on salah. We believe in Allah. We believe in the Messenger of Allah. We believe in Islam. But we are weak as human beings. This one has a girlfriend. That one is drinking khamar. That one is smoking crack. That one is smoking weed. This one is not praying. That one, she doesn't wear hijab. But she believes in Allah and His Messenger. You put a gun to her head, what do you believe in? She's going to say, Allah and His Messenger. Do you believe Isa is the Ibn of Allah? She says, Wallahi, I don't believe that. Then why are you not wearing hijab? I'm just weak. Make dua for me. So we have these shortcomings. Yawm al-Qiyamah, Rasulullah will have intercession for his community. People will go to the hellfire. He will intercede. He'll take some out, and some people he will even save from going in at all. So Abu Huraira wanted to know, which one of us will have the most right to that shifa? Rasulullah said, I didn't think anyone would proceed you to that question, Abu Huraira. You are the student who's always around me. You're learning the hadith. You're learning the deen. It's only natural that someone like you who's paying attention to your religion will come up with an intelligent question like that. And then he answered and he said, As'adunnas bi shafa'ati yawm al-qiyamah man qala la ilaha illallah khalisin min qalbihi The one who will have the most right to ma shifa'a yawm al-qiyamah is the one who says la ilaha illallah with ikhlas from his heart. He says la ilaha illallah with ikhlas. And ikhlas means what? He says it with his lisan and you can see it on his jawarih, you see it on his limbs. So if someone wants to sit back and just rely on I'm a Muslim, it's not enough. The one who Rasulullah will intercede for وسلم, is the one who makes ikhlas. فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا And whoever wants to meet Allah, you know you're going to meet Allah, then let him do the righteous deeds and actions and don't make shirk with Allah. Don't set up partners. No angel, no righteous man, no peer, no nabi. Rasulullah is our intermediary in terms of showing us how to gain Allah's pleasure. But Allah, he doesn't deserve to be worshipped. Nor should we say, Ya Rasulullah, we only make dua to Allah Azawajal. So, from the etiquette of a dua is to get away from asking Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ask Allah directly. The second etiquette from the Quran is that in making dua, we all have to come to realize that the correct way of making dua is that it has to be in accordance to the sunnah. It has to be in accordance to the way Rasulullah made the dua and the way his companions made the dua. Not in the way that we want to make the dua, the ibadat of al-Islam, unless we want to be like the Christians and the Jews. Those people Rasulullah said about them and us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لَتَتَّبِعُنَّ سُنَّنَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلُكُمْ شِبَرْ بِشِبَرْ وَذَرَى بِذَرَى حَتَّى لَوْ دَخَلُوا حُفْرَةُ جُحْدُبْ لَدَخَلْتَمُوهَا You people are going to follow the ways of the people who came before you. A hand span by a hand span. An arm span by an arm span. To the point, if they were to enter into the lizard's hole, you people will enter into the lizard's hole. The lizard's hole. If the lizard goes into his hole and you caught him, before he got all the way in, you caught him by the tail, but he's inside the hole. Wallahi, you're going to separate the lizard from his body. You're going to break his tail off before you pull him out of the hole. Because once he gets in that hole, he's in there. So that's Rasulullah's way of telling us everything that those people did, you people are going to do it. They worship Isa ibn Maryam, you people are going to worship me. By making dua to me. By saying I'm from the Nur of Allah. By raising me above the station that I deserve.
I'm Abdullah and his messenger. Not from the nur of Allah. I don't know the unseen unless Allah tells me and so forth and so on. So as it relates to dua, our dua is ibadah and it has to be done according to what Rasulullah Sallallahu and his companions brought. That's from Surah Al-Fatiha. Where is that in Surah Al-Fatiha? That is in the statement of Allah Ta'ala, Surat Al-Ladheena An'amta Alayhim. Surat Al-Ladheena An'amta Alayhim. The path of those people who you gave them your ni'mah. Guide us to the straight path. Ihdina Surat Al-Mustaqeem. Surat Al-Ladheena An'amta Alayhim. Guide us to the surat that is straight. The path of those people you gave them the, your favor. The scholars of the tafsir of the Quran, when they explain the surat al-mustaqeem, everyone knows it's the straight path. But the scholars of Islam said, the surat al-mustaqeem is the surat of the companions. They are the example. Allah knew that they were the ones who had to be the vanguard of Islam. Because if he would have made us responsible, for carrying this deen and establishing this deen, we would have dropped the ball. We would have dropped the ball. Inshallah, we're going to take questions now. Um, if the sisters have any questions, they can write them down on a piece of paper. And if they leave them on one of the chairs at the front, Inshallah, someone will bring them up. And the brothers, if they want to stick their hand up, um, they can do that and we'll take questions from the floor as well, inshallah. Well, we've got some here already, and most of them seem to be connected to Abu Osama's talk. So the first question that we're going to put to him is, I agree regarding the fact that we should only ask of Allah. However, the Prophet wasallam will have the ability to intercede for us, for his ummah, on the Day of Judgment. Hence, should we not remember the Prophet ﷺ and send uh, peace and blessings upon him when his name is mentioned? Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah ma ba'd. Yes, you should send salutations upon Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when his name is mentioned. And not to do so has been described by him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as being al-bukhul or stingy. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Bakhil, Man Dhukirut Indahu, Falam Yusallam Alayya. The stingy one, the Bakhil, is the one who my name is mentioned, and he doesn't send salams upon me, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In addition to that, there was a man who made dua in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And he went right into the dua, O oh Allah, give me this, O oh Allah, give me that, O oh Allah, help me, O oh Allah. And then the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لَقَدْ تَعَجَّلَ هَذَا That man was in haste. That man was in haste. And then he taught us from the etiquette of a dua. إِذَا قَعَدَ أَحَدُكُمْ لِلدُّعَى فَلْيَذْكُرُ اللَّهِ بِمَا هُوَ أَهْلُ لَهُ ثُمَّ لِيُسَلِّ عَلَيَّ ثُمَّ لِيَدْعُ بِمَا شَاءَ If any of you makes dua, then make dua by praising Allah. Before you get into your dua, O oh Allah, you are the greatest. O oh Allah, you know. O oh Allah, you are Rahman Rahim. You are Razak. You are the one who knows and I don't know. I'm a sinner, O oh Allah. And then after that, send salutations upon me, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then make dua for whatever you want. So the issue is not about sending salutations upon him. The issue is not about can he make intercession for us, Yom Al-Qiyamah. The issue is making dua to Allah alone. He has shifa, and we should make salutations upon him, but we should not ask him in our dua. Wallahu a'la wa a'la. Okay, we have a few questions for Brother Ilyas. Inshallah, he's going to deal with them quickly, Inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, first question is regarding salah. A sister asks, uh, I think it's a sister, she's asking that she she uh, works in a school 
and uh, it's difficult for her to find a place to pray because many of the places there they have pictures and faces of animals and is praying in such a place acceptable so uh, and, and she relates that in relation to you know prayer being the first thing which is to be established on Yom Al-Qiyam. What she should try to, try to do this is to find uh, the most acceptable place that she can within her school, the most acceptable place. And if it's possible for her to cover also, okay, some of the pictures, okay, that are present. Okay, this won't really be possible in a school. A lot of the open plan schools now they have pictures everywhere. So really, this is something which is beyond the control of the sister. Okay, so really, the sister should strive as much as she can within her. That does not necessitate leaving the obligation of prayer. So obviously, she still has to perform the obligation of prayer, and her prayer will be, inshallah, accepted. Okay, in that in that particular environment. Secondly, a uh, questioner asks about the example I gave of the child who said uh, that her, the family environment, okay, was a family environment in which you know the uh, that everything in the home was like jahannam. How do we overcome such a situation? Okay, in, in a situation like this, obviously. Uh, well, you know, there's an absence, obviously, of any kind of tarbiyah, any kind of education, any kind of guidance, any kind of nasiha or advising the family upon Islam. And this has to be done in a way which, uh, because of the absence of this, then obviously the state of the family has developed as it is. You know, now, the advising of the family has to be done in a way which, okay, is, uh, uh, you know, based upon how the Prophet has told us, okay, things should be made easy for them, beginning with teaching them about the fundamentals of the religion, teaching them about them the relationship with Allah and their ma'rifatullah, their awareness of uh, what their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like, okay, then teaching them about the, the, the guidance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and slowly introducing into the house, okay, different forms of Islamic behavior like salah, okay, like uh, Quran, Quranic recita- recitation, okay, getting them to change and alter the layout of their home slowly and gradually so that they begin by perhaps developing one room, okay, which is a room uh, which they just dedicate for worship, dedicate for uh, salah, establishing a masallah in the home, establishing uh, a time of the day where there is some tarbiyah that takes place in the home, either someone comes in, a family member comes in, okay, or they invite someone in, or one of the family members directly, the head of the family perhaps, okay, gives a reminder in the home every day. These are practical, simple ways that you can actually establish a more tranquil Muslim household, okay, and there are, you know, simple practical things that we can do. Often what we find ourselves doing is that we make Okay, we sometimes alienate families even more by coming in with a very harsh and with a very rough approach. The Prophet has told us, yes, do, wala do, as do. Make things easy, do not make things difficult for the people. This doesn't mean that uh, completely, uh, like you said, compromise the religion. What it means is that make it as easy as possible for the people to worship Allah, to fear Allah, okay, and to, uh, uh, you know, establish a more Islamic household. And there should be a balance in terms of, uh, okay, reward uh, and giving them good news and warnings as well. Our religion and the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is characterized by this, that this is a book in which there is reward, uh, you know, uh, glad tidings which are given, good news, and also warnings which are given in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. And likewise, you know, this is the carrot and stick type of approach. You know, we take this approach with the Muslims as well. Okay, we reward them in terms of, we, uh, we encourage them in terms of their good actions, and then we also make them aware of the, of the you know, give them the warnings for any kind of the evil actions as, that they might be performing as well. Okay, the next question for Abu Osama is what is the ruling on music? Is it allowed, is it disliked, or is it forbidden? Certainly in answering these questions, I just want to make mention of this very quickly, and that is, I'm sure that many of you brothers and sisters have Islam channel, and the people who come to give the verdicts on the Islam channel, um, we want the people of the Islam channel to raise up the level, to raise the bar in terms of the answering of the questions. Um, I saw, as I usually do, whenever the person who's answering the question, he's asked a question and he's given the answer, well, this madhab says that, and this madhab says that, and it depends on your madhab and this and that. We want to do away with all of that. We want to know what does Allah and his messenger say. We want to know what does Allah and his messenger have to say. So what we're going to try to do here today, inshallah, is not preoccupy you with what a madhab said, this sheikh said that, that sheikh said that. But it's what Allah and his messenger said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if we don't have that ability to do it, we'll let you know, I think it's like that. And then it's up to you to follow it or not to follow it. But we want to advise you, brothers and sisters, when it comes to answering questions or taking an answer for a particular question, 
We have to get away from what the Muslims have become today. If a sheikh or Malvi Saab or the peer or the madhab says this, we're going to take it even though the Dalil goes against it or there's no proof to prove what they are saying. So as it relates to the issue of music, music is haram and it is a kabira from the kada'ir, it's a major sin. And there are a lot of adilla that clearly, a lot of proofs that clearly show that music is haram, not permissible. From those, adilla is the authentic hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam said, سيأتي في آخر الزمان من أمتي أقوام يستحلون الحرى والحرير والمعازف They are going to come a group of people from the last time from my Ummah They are going to be a group of people who are going to try to make halal zina They are going to make halal zina They are going to make halal the men wearing silk and they're going to try to make halal and ma'azif musical instruments. So if they're going to try to make musical instruments halal, that means that the instruments are haram and what comes out of the instruments are haram. And that's what we have today. People saying, no, there's another opinion. The sheikh said that, that men have said this, but they said this. Rasulullah told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, أن الصوتين الأحمقين الصراخة عند النزول المصيبة والمعازف He said I prohibit you people from the two foolish voices the two ignorant voices the first voice is the wailing and the screaming that a lady does at the death of a relative the relative dies and they start smacking themselves in the face and ripping their clothes open and saying, why God, why did you take them all, help the... And they, he said, I'll prohibit you from this. And also from the second foolish voice, and that is the musical instrument. So the proof of the impermissibility of music is mutawatir. There are too many adilla, and I would like to draw your attention to purchase the book, The Ruling of Music in Islam by Abu Bilal Mustafa Kennedy a white revert brother who studied in Mecca, who was from Canada. It's probably one of the best books, if not the best book written in English for the ruling of music. Okay, a number of questions. One first question regarding, I've heard that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used to call the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Muhammad, and some people say, okay, could you please elaborate? Of course, Abu Bakr is going to refer to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Muhammad, because he's in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was alive in his time, and so he is directing, he is obviously addressing him in the correct way, which is Al Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, what we know from the practice of the Sahaba, however, is this, that in the Tashahud, okay, in the Tashahud of the prayer, this bit, as we know, at tahiyatu Lillahi, what we do in the, in the, uh, in the prayer, that in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu they used to recite the, uh, the part of the Tashahud, Ya Yuhan Nabi, O Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then Aisha radiallahu anha, she relates, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, the Sahaba, they would say, As-Salamu Alan Nabi. So they altered it to, O, uh, o Messenger, Rather than uh, assalamu alaikum, uh, you know, uh, peace and blessings be upon the messenger. Rather than peace and blessings be upon all the messenger. So they altered this very. Uh, they altered this after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So therefore, in the time of the Prophet sallallahu obviously when he was alive, they used to call him Ya Muhammad. After he passed away, obviously, then uh, they did not refer to him as uh, directly present or hazard or uh, amongst them at the time. Also, obviously, when the when he was not in the company or direct company of the. Sahaba, then obviously they didn't, call, didn't say O Muhammad either. Also, this contradicts the saying of Ya Muhammad, contradicts what is clearly uh, established in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has mentioned obviously in numerous places in the Quran, but one verse in particular in Surah Al Jinn, Kul inna ma adu rabbi wala ushrik bi ahbihi ahada. Say, O Muhammad, I only call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I am not from those people who are from the mushrikeen. So, here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders the Messenger وسلم, to make his dua, make his call only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to call on anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to do so is shirk, is to make partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if the Prophet sallallahu came to call mankind to the worship of Allah, away from the worship of creation, and has all ordered us to make our seela, to make our, like I said, call directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to the creation, okay, then it completely contradicts the sunnah that the people now, they call upon the Prophet. They call upon the Messenger like they call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they make this something which is equivalent. 
When you go to these masjids, you see that they have Ya Allah and Ya Muhammad, okay, on the same level. That's something which is equivalent, okay, in, in terms of how we call upon Allah. And this is something which is clearly forbidden, okay, by the, in the book of Allah SWT. Next, a number of questions regarding Milad and Nabi about celebration of the, the birthday of the Prophet Wasallam and how is this to be celebrated. Okay, to, to put the, uh, in, in to kind of very simplify this question, we celebrate, okay, or this matter of the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu how it is to be venerated or celebrated. We have an example in a group of people, okay, who are the people who love the Messenger Sallallahu more than any other group of people who can love him. Okay, and they are the companions of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we find in no, none of the Sahaba do we find this practice of celebrating or making it a day of Eid, a day in addition to the days that Allah Ta'ala has already instituted in the religion, another additional day of Eid where they celebrated the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nor do we find this in the first generation of the Muslims, the Tabi'een, or the Itba Tabi'een, the third generation of the Muslims. We don't find it in any authentic narration, in any of the books of Hadith. Okay, rather we find this is a fabricated uh, uh, practice which was developed centuries after Okay, the uh, death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it has no basis in the Sharia. It is not constituted in the, in the book of Allah SWT with a direct hadith, a direct verse or any direct hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu where he's asking us to venerate his birthday or celebrate his birthday. And so this is one of the practices which the Prophet Sallallahu says is to be rejected because it has no authority okay, in, the, in the Sharia at all. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has mentioned Anyone introduces into this affair, into this command, that which is not from it will have it rejected by Allah SWT. And also the great verse that I mentioned in the talk that this day I've perfected your religion. So Allah Ta'ala has completed and perfected Islam. And so from that perfection is that there is nothing more that needs to be added to Islam. No further addition, no kind of uh, 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 re-modification or reinvention or okay, re-defining you know, Islam. None of that is required. Nothing can be entered into the Amr or the affair of Islam that can bring you closer to the worship of Allah SWT except that it has already been given to us by the Messenger wasallam. So to introduce a new practice is something which is innovation and all innovation is heading for, for misguidance. So this practice of celebrating the birthday of the Prophet has no authority in the religion. Rather it is a practice really of imitating the Kuffar because they celebrate the birthday of their saints and they celebrate the birthday of their prophets. And so the Muslims have emulated them rather than follow the pure and uh, authentic uh, traditions of the Prophet We have a question here. Can you please give the references about the fatwa of the companions as being binding proofs over others? Where's the proof that shows that the positions, the Islamic legal verdicts, the understanding of the companions, where's the proof that their understanding and their verdicts are binding upon us? Very intelligent question. There are many proofs from the Quran and the Sunnah and from the statements of the companions themselves. From the Quran, Allah Ta'ala has established, فَإِنْ آمَنُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَدْ اِهْتَدَوْا Allah has established in the Quran, Surah Ali Imran, and if they believe the way you and your companions believe, then they have been guided aright. So that goes to show that your understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah has to be in accordance to what the companions say. Also, Allah Ta'ala said in Surah An-Nisa, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقَ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُسْرِهِ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا And whoever opposes the messenger after the knowledge has come to him, and he rejects and goes against the way of the companions, the way of the believers, then we will turn him to that which he wants and we will lead him into the hellfire and what an evil abode that is. Those are two clear ayahs from the Quran and there are others. As for the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the time when he was dying, his companion Irbad ibn Sari radiallahu anhu said that Rasulullah gave them sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an exhortation that caused the eyes to shed tears and caused the, uh, the hearts to tremble with fear the way he was addressing them. So they say, Ya Rasulullah, ka'annaha mu'idatin muwadda. Ya Rasulullah, it is as if you're giving us a farewell speech. Like you're going to die. The things that you're talking about, it appears that you're about to die. So give us some advice. Tell us what to do. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the long advice that he gave from what he said was, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسَيَارَ اخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالسُنَّةِ 
والسنة الخلفاء الراشدين المهديين من بعدي عدوا عليها بالنواجذ وإياكم ومحدثة الأمور فإن كل بدعة المحدثة He said Verily those from amongst you who live for a long time You live 1425 years after me Those from amongst you who live a long time You're going to see a lot of ikhtilaf a lot of differences. He's going to say this, he say that, he say that. Different opinions. So therefore I advise you to take my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa from the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Also concerning this ikhtilaf, these many positions and opinions, this Hanafi, and he only stick with Hanafi, that's Maliki, he only stick with Maliki, that Jamaat Tabliq, he only stick with Jamaat Tabliq, that's Ikhwani, he only stick with Ikhwani. I don't want to hear anything except what my Imam said. The Prophet said about that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sallam, Wa Sataftariqu Ummati Ala Thalatha Wa Sabaeena Firqa, Kulluha Finnar, Illa Wahida. Qila Wa Man Wahida Ya Rasulullah, Qal, Alladhi Ala Mithri Ma Ana Alihi Al Yom Wa Ashabi. He said that my ummah is going to split up into 73 different sects. All of those sects will be rejected. They'll all be in the hellfire except one. They said, which one is that, Ya Rasulullah? He said, the one that is doing what I'm doing today and my companions. So anytime someone comes to you revert brothers, you newly practicing brothers and sisters, and they want to tell you it's permissible to blow this up, it's permissible to blow that up, it's permissible this, elections, permissible that, that, you should ask the simple question. Did the companions understand that ayat the way you're using it? Did the companions in Surah Al-Baqarah, the Surah of the Cow, it says, Verily Allah orders you to slaughter the Baqarah, the cow. There are some people say, the cow here is symbolic of Aisha. It means slaughter Aisha, kill Aisha. Did the companions understand that verse like that? Then it's not permissible for you to understand it like that as well. The next question is, this person said, As a part of our preparation for the hereafter, are we going to be accountable for dying in a non-Muslim country as opposed to dying in a non-Muslim country, even if we strive to be practicing Muslims according to the Quran and the Sunnah? Jazakallahu khaira wa antum kadari. We want to add on to that, striving to practice Islam according to the Quran and the Sunnah, the way the companions practice and understood it. Because everyone's calling, I'm on the Quran and the Sunnah, but they're saying, blow this one up. I'm on the Quran and Sunnah, but say, no one's going to say, I'm not on the Quran and Sunnah. The Quran and the Sunnah, the way the companions understood it and practiced. Concerning this question, it's a big topic. In general, Muslims should live in a place where they can practice their deen, whether that's a Muslim country or a non-Muslim country. If you can practice your deen, it's permissible to stay in a non-Muslim country. If you can show that you're a Muslim, salah, zakah, hijab, practice your religion is permissible. But if you are in a place where you can't practice your deen, even if it's in a Muslim country, if you can't practice your Islam, then Al-Islam has ordered you to look for a place to go and practice your religion. As Allah Azza wa has mentioned in Surah An-Nisa, in al-Ladina tawafahum al-malaikatu zalimi anfusim qalu fima kuntum qalu kunna mustadafina fil ard qalu alam takun ardullahi wasi'atan fatuhajiru fiha those people with the malaika claimed their souls while they were in a state of oppression. The malaika will raise them up and say, what was your condition in the earth? The person will say, I was weak and oppressed. I was in Dar Kufr. I was in the UK, US. I was weak and oppressed. The malaika will say, why didn't you make hijra? Wasn't Allah's earth spacious that you could have made hijra in it? So if a person is finding himself unable to practice the deen in a non-Muslim society, he has to get up and he has to leave. But now the question that presents itself is, where is he going to go today? Is he going to go to Somalia? 
is he going to go to a country, another country in Africa or Asia where he's going to suffer from malaria and diphtheria and leishmania, the sand fly and hepatitis? Is he going to go to Iraq? Where is he going to go? So we have to make do with our situation as we are here right now. But if you can go somewhere where it's better and you can practice your deen, then we say that's something that should be done. Here we have another question as it relates to elections. We are coming soon to see the likes of MCB calling for Muslims to vote. But isn't voting isn't voting shirk? If so, can you explain this to the brothers and sisters and the importance of keeping away from voting? Also, in addition to this question, what is the ruling of a Muslim woman standing for an MP election in UK, working for her and voting for her? What's the ruling concerning that? Concerning the Muslim woman becoming an MP or taking positions of leadership like that, Islam doesn't allow it. It's impermissible, it's haram. And we're not in the business of trying to please the elitists or the modernists or the liberals. We're not in that. This is not why we are sitting before you, to make people happy. We're not here to make people angry anyway, as well. We're here to say what Allah and His Messenger said. And Allah's Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then yuflihu qawm, wallu amrahum imra'a. A group of people will not be successful who puts a woman in charge of their affairs. And the affairs here means the political process where the woman is in charge of the show. It also means the family in which the husband is under the thumb of the lady, of the, of the wife. She's the one who says, I'm going to go visit my sister. You stay home and take care of the kids. <laughs> or he wants to go out and he has to come and say, honey, I want to go out. Can I go? She says, no. <laughs> he will never be successful. And the Prophet said about him, وسلم, la yadkhurul jannah ad-dayyuth. The dayyuth will not enter into jannah. Who is the day youth? The day youth is the Muslim man who his women folk, those women who he's responsible for, his wife, his daughter, his sisters, he's responsible for them. He can't say to them anything. They come when they want, they go when they want, they do what they want, they wear what they want, and he can't say, hey, turn that off. Hey, don't let her in here. Hey, you can't go there. The Muslim man, that, that doesn't mean that he's over her muscles, a macho man, but the Muslim man has his position and the woman has her position and we bite our tongue for no one in terms of apologizing what Allah has legislated. If you can't get with that, if you don't accept that, that's your problem. But as it relates to the Quran and the Sunnah, that's our deen. As it relates to elections, elections could be kufr. It could be, but not necessarily. Because Allah has mentioned in the Quran, وَمَن لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ فُؤْلَاكَ هُمُ الْمُشْرِكُونَ Whoever does not judge by that which Allah has revealed, then they are mushrikun, they are polytheists. So judging by other than what Allah revealed is what they do here. So the Muslim who gets in that process, that's what he wants to do ultimately. But maybe the Muslim's goal and the objective is to say we need representation in the House of Parliament. We need representation in the local political arena. So in that case, is it permissible? I'm of the opinion that it's not permissible. That most of the Muslims who engage in the political process, MCB or other than that, and I'm not against them. I don't even know who they are. But usually the Muslims who are preoccupied with politics, they compromise the religion of Al-Islam, number one. Number two, when we engage in the political process, when we engage in the political process, don't we find that Rasulullah found himself in a similar situation? That the kuffar came to him and said, Yeah, Muhammad, we see your deen is, is growing. You are forced to be reckoned with. So look, this is what we want to do. Join us. One year we'll worship Allah, and then the next year you worship our God. Join us. Come and get with the program, Ya Muhammad. Rasulullah told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after the ayat was revealed, Qul, Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun, La abudu ma ta'budu, wala ta'budu, wala ta'budu ma abud. That's our deen. So what did the Prophet do to bring about social change, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? That has been clearly defined in the Quran and the Sunnah. And that's what we have to do. The political process is a shortcut that's not going to work. And I end 
George Bush won not this election, the one prior to that, and it was the Muslim vote that got him over the hump. All of the political analysts say this, and this is a fact. It was the first time in history the Muslims came together and said, let's get behind one candidate. And they got behind George Bush, who made a number of promises. And then after he won, as politicians do, they play politics. Once he won, he was an ignited fire against the Muslims. And he has continued to be a fire that has been ignited against the Muslims. So what did they bring to us, the political process? When we find the Muslims in America, Muslims for Bush, he did a program on them here in this country. Asian lady, rich billionaires. Asian lady, Asian man. They were at the family table and they said, the lady said, Muslims for Bush, billionaires. She said, when I read the Quran, I find the Quran so sexy. Those are the type of people who we want running our siyasa, our politics. No, back to the Quran and the Sunnah. If we address these issues as Rasulullah addressed them, وسلم, then Allah Azawajal is going to bring about the change. If you people help Allah, Allah will help you and He'll establish your feet firmly. Helping Allah is practicing His deen. Okay, brothers, I'd just like to apologize to all the brothers who have written questions and they haven't been answered. We've, got, we've probably got about 100 here and we've got five minutes to finish. Before I ask Brother Elias to just give us a few um, concluding remarks, um, I've been asked to just let you know um, and thank on behalf of uh, the Islamic Society. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Darul Salaam Bookshop on Country Road for sponsoring this, this event and for National Halal on Lady Pool Road for um, providing the food for today's program. And Jazakallah Khair uh, to the speakers who came such a long way to, to address this uh, conference today. Inshallah, I'll hand you over to Brother Ilyas who will just make a few comments and then we'll call it a day. Jazakallah Khair. Just one question, inshallah. Uh, someone has uh, asked, if you say that celebrating the, the Prophet Wasallam's birthday is bidah, so why are you using a microphone as a Prophet did not use such items? Now, there is a, and again, this is an important point here, that there is an important distinction between those things which are innovation in terms of the worship, which are related quite clearly to the Amr of Allah or the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a way of coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and those things which are innovations in terms of the worldly matters. Regarding innovations in terms of the worldly matters, obviously the Quran and the Sunnah does not explain every innovation or technological development that will take place in history. So what we have in the Quran and the Sunnah are principles which explain to us okay, how we can okay, uh, apply these in terms of uh, you know, what we consider as uh, good and bad and what is how, how we have for Quran distinction between affairs. And regarding the worldly matters, there's a principle called Ahkam al-Masadiq, which means that the uh, uh, the ruling on a particular matter is based upon its outcome. So with, with regards to microphones, microphones are based on whether it is permissible or impermissible, or whether it's allowed or not, is depending on what the outcome for which is chosen. So if a microphone in itself is used to present an Islamic talk, because the outcome is something which is halal, because the outcome is something which is khair, inshallah, then, it, the, then the means also is permissible. However, as we know, microphones can also be used for things which are haram as well, such as concerts and such as music and rap and all that kind of stuff. Okay, in that case, obviously, the outcome is haram, so that the means also becomes haram as well. So the outcome or the uh, permissibility of a thing depends upon the outcome of it. If the outcome is haram, then the means also becomes haram as well. So these things in terms of innovations, in terms of uh, uh, means of transport, Okay, technologies and things like this. Okay, these are not the innovations which are referred to when the Prophet said, وَكُلُّ بِدَةٍ ضَلَالَ وَكُلُّ دَلَالٍ فِي النَّارِ All bid'ah is misguidance and all misguidance is upon a path which leads to the fire. Here he is referring clearly to the bid'ah, okay, with the innovations which are referring to ibadah, the affair of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the affair of worship is something which is, okay, closed or restricted to only what the Prophet sallallahu has made permissible. Regarding the matters of the dunya, then everything is halal in the dunya, except if it is made haram by a clear proof in the book and the sunnah. Regarding worship, all worship is haram. 
Okay, but actually, now all things in the dunya are halal except if they are made haram by a clear proof regarding ibadah or worship coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the prescribed things. Okay, then this all of that worship is haram except what the Prophet sallallahu has made halal. So every form of salah is haram except what the Prophet sallallahu is halal. Every form of showing love for Rasulullah sallallahu is haram except what he has permitted and made halal through his sahaba. In terms of this matter of how we uh, love Rasulullah, how we honor them, we honor him by implementing his sunnah and in light and bringing life to his sunnah every day and every moment of our lives not just one one day uh, of the of the year and allah knows best <laughs>